My name is Eric Pooling. In 2018, I walked 3,000 miles from Mexico to Canada. And now, my goal is to blaze a new long-distance hiking route through Nevada's unique basin and range topography. It's a thousand miles of stunning ridge walks, vast desert valleys, an unparalleled adventure. There are few established trails and no guidebooks to follow. Instead, I'll be writing my own along the way. And I'll be doing it in the heat of the summer. This is Nevada's Basin and Range Trail. I've spent the last several months going over my maps, plotting water sources, and piecing together what little information I could find. I know it's going to be beautiful, I know it's going to be hard, but other than that, I'm really not sure what to expect. And for me, that's what makes it so exciting. Just landed in Salt Lake City. I'm waiting for my friend here to pick me up and uh, get a ride out to Ely, Nevada and start this thing. like a complete whiteout, really. I just leave in Ely, Nevada here, taking my first steps out onto the Basin and Range Trail. It's gonna be an adventure. This route is roughly a thousand miles, and I've broken it up into 10 sections. And those are the Egan Mountains up there, and I'm gonna be roughly walking the crest, but just on the other side. And they actually got some snow last week. Absolutely unbelievable. Next gas, 167 miles. That kind of remoteness just defines Nevada. And that's why I'm out here. Get off Highway 6 here, get into the wilderness. Well, this is the first watering hole I've come to. These are the troughs I saw on satellite when I did my research for this uh, route. And completely bone dry. And yet another hill to climb. Every time I start a hike, the first day just feels so brutal. Ooh, here we go. Here's a Primo water source. That's a good sign though. It's a good sign to see some sort of running water. And finally about to make my way up there to the upper terrace and uh, it's a 2000 foot climb from here. So the entire route is pretty much like that. Anytime you leave a town, I mean, it's like a four or 5,000 foot climb, 6,000 foot climb up to the mountains. There's definitely some great stuff ahead along this route, but this first section isn't going to be a very good representation of what the Basin and Range Trail has to offer. This first section is a bit more tame than the others by necessity and by design to allow a few days to get my trail legs. Even still, it's day one, and I'm going up to just shy of 10,000 feet today, and that's a lot to ask of a hiker coming from sea level. Well, I get the majority of the big climb done, and I'm on an area now called the Upper Terrace as it's marked on the map. Wow, that's impressive. The first steps of a long journey are as exciting as they are difficult. My first day is spent trying to make sense of what will become my life for the next two months. Dispenser. Bong? Dispenser bong? Explosive? Literally says explosive. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I could use some water, so I guess I'll pull some water from this uh, dispenser bong. We got this leak here from the pipe, so I think I'll collect it from that. Quite a bit more water than I was expecting. Kind of figured there'd be some water just because, I mean, they just got snow here, a foot or two, like last week. So I'm assuming that's a lot of meltwater from that. So later in the summer, I'm gonna definitely have some water issues in a few areas. Well, that's pretty impressive over there. So this is a pretty good view. And from here, you can see how there's a range basin and another range. And you know, on its own, this is just one valley here and that's meaningless, but this pattern of basin and range, basin and range repeats itself throughout most of Nevada. And these mountains are typically tall, narrow, fault block mountains formed as the result of the earth being pulled apart here. 
and these forces have given rise to at least 314 named mountain ranges in Nevada, second only to Alaska. Here on the Basin and Range Trail, the goal is to walk over 20 of them. Canyon walls down there, basically vertical. And then, you know, some of these ridges over here, just beautiful. Well, it's early evening now. I've probably got uh, 15 miles or so on the day. I'm trying to find a spot inside of the wind. We got like 35 mile an hour winds today. So I'm gonna head down and check out this spot here and see if that's gonna work for me. Just set up camp here. Oh, I'm pretty whooped. Struggling to uh, kind of get an appetite really. You know, try and eat some dinner, but I'm really not that hungry. All I want to do is just go to bed. I'm just so tired. <sighs> Had a nice long night of sleep, or if you can call it sleep. Went to bed at 7.45. <laughs> One of the earliest bedtimes I can remember in a long time. First, uh, first week's gonna be pretty hard. It's not like the CDT where, you know, it was pretty flat in the beginning. You kind of ease into it. Really just kind of second guess yourself the whole time. Like, can I even do this? But once you get moving, the aches and pains from the day before kind of go away. And somehow it's just possible. There's another off piped spring anyway. There's a pipe coming out of that. Been a decent amount of water, more than I've uh, expected here so far. The first couple days of a long distance hike can be difficult times. Not only is your body adjusting to the rigors of non-stop walking, but also a change in eating habits and sleep schedules. And to make matters worse, I'm beginning to feel the effects of the altitude, which mainly just kills my appetite. I've barely eaten anything out here so far, and I'm really hoping that changes today. So there's this uh, tiny spring here very tiny and this is basically the last water before I have to climb up there up to the ridge line there 10,000 feet and uh, follow that a ways off trail there is a bit of a flow you can kind of see trickling down here so I'm gonna try and uh, figure out what I'm gonna do to be able to scoop from this I'm gonna use this uh, piece of women's pantyhose it's a pre-filter. Very slow. Very slow. It's not quite deep enough to get a full liter. So I got like three quarter of a liter here. And repeat. I'm doing a little side hilling, contouring around this uh, this hill here, trying to avoid dipping down into the valley down there because it just goes right back up. So it's kind of intermittent like game trail, but mostly it's just sort of walking in between this like sagebrush. This uh, four by four road just kind of peters out and then it's a cross country hike across that ridge line for a little ways. Yeah, man, it's pretty nice. This is really cool to find. This is a coral fossil. I'm at 10,000 feet. That tells me the rocks here on top of this mountain were underwater, part of a giant seabed at one point. You know, fascinating to think about really the forces at play to just thrust these mountains up high like this. This is the summit of Willow Peak. And that's where I came from yesterday. You can see the upper terrace there. That's where I was uh, last night where I camped. I made my way all the way up this ridge line and down to this uh, saddle and uh, just summited this peak. And I'm gonna continue on down the ridge line all the way down this mountain range. And I'm following this uh, 
fairly decent little game trail. I just spotted an elk right beyond the trees over there. Oh no, that's a pronghorn, I think. Yeah, there he is. There's two of them. Yeah, they spotted me. I just stopped for lunch. I so, was actually pretty hungry, which is a great sign because yesterday I had no appetite. I had to choke down my dinner. Kind of the same thing with breakfast. And uh, so it's a real relief to feel that rumble in the stomach. I'm off trail now in just really thick woods. I'm on another game trail here, and it's amazing. These game trails are practically as good as uh, you know, just regular trails for the most part. Um, some spots are a little bit more faint, but it, I mean, you know, it's cleared out and gives you a place to walk. Almost at the top of this ridge line. Just gonna go through some of this nightmarish shrub. Oh, man. Uh, there's really just no other way. Oh. Oh. Holy shit. And uh, yeah, almost there. And for me, the real adventure begins when I leave the trail behind. It just heightens your senses and you feel a little extra excitement. A trail takes you somewhere and you follow. Without a trail, you are free to roam as you please. Unfortunately, the footage from the rest of today and tomorrow morning was lost, and I only have still photos to tell the story. And I'm just thankful it was only a 32 gigabyte card and not one of the many 128 gigabyte cards I typically use. So after a while, I jumped off the ridge and I headed down into Water Canyon. It was pretty tough going at first, a few small pour offs, really thick, a lot of thorn bushes. It was worth the effort though. I found a really nice creek flowing through a narrow, lush canyon. It's just the break spot I needed. I washed off the dirt, sweat, blood, and just tried to rehydrate. I took four liters with me. From here, my next planned water source is 27 miles. But the way water's been here, I'm just not that worried about it. And this area was surprisingly beautiful. Lots of striking limestone formations. And by now it's early evening, and my goal is to make it to the top of the next pass. Millard Spring is just below the summit, and Summit Spring on the top but I expect both to be dry. And the plan for tomorrow is to continue up the ridge line to Egan Benchmark. So the top of that pass makes a lot of sense for tonight's camp. It's just that the final climb has really wiped me out. Now I thought my appetite was back earlier today, but that was premature. I'm really starting to hit the wall now, just having expended a lot of energy and taking in very little. The next morning I dug a hole to collect water from the nearby Millard Spring. And I also decided against bagging Egan Benchmark and began walking downhill instead, contemplating my options. And my original plan was to go up this uh, ridge here and uh, follow that for about three or four miles, uh, hit Egan Benchmark. But with my lack of appetite and just, uh, I know my limits uh, from being in this situation before, um, I hate to say it, but I'm gonna drop down into this valley and just take a lower route around all this stuff I wanted to hit. But this is a really beautiful range though. You got these like spires and just like vertical rock formations. And uh, it's really green and just really pleasant, you know? 
just a slow drip coming out of this one. And good thing I filled up with water earlier because uh, this one doesn't look too appealing. The last couple miles I've noticed all these trees have been cut down. It's like anything, any tree of any size has just been clear cut. You know, they haven't taken the wood, they're just cutting them down. So I wonder why that is. Fire prevention, some sort of animal habitat, uh, you know, initiative, I don't know. So I'm just walking down the road here and I found this unopened Gatorade bottle. Probably fell out of somebody's uh, razor, side by side thing. It's pretty hot, but hey, I think I'll take it with me. And uh, here's the dry well. I wonder when the last time this thing saw water. And finally, I'm gonna reach this uh, larger dirt road. Couldn't even tell there was a road there. I haven't seen a single car kick up any dust or anything. This is Bullwhack Summit, and this marks the end of uh, Steptoe Valley, which I've been following a better part of the morning now. And the other side of this is Cape Valley. Mmm, this one looks really appetizing. Get your daily dosage of greens with this water source. What the hell is this? A shoot. Like a feed shoot or something. I don't know, farm stuff. No water. There's like a coyote or a fox right there. You probably can't see him. But you can see over there, blades of that windmill, which is where I'm going for water. So it's a good sign there's probably water there. It's good enough for him. Cool, pretty cool. One thing I've noticed about these water sources in Nevada is they like to put their pipe well over the trough to where you can't really reach it from the side. Uh, it kind of stopped dripping now that the wind died down. It's pretty green, but ye old Sawyer filter will take care of that. And most of the greenness is really at the bottom. It's actually pretty clear. Not too bad. I'm gonna filter this with the old Sawyer. So while I was filtering water back there, I had my head down and uh, all of a sudden I heard this noise. It sounded like uh, one of the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. And it was the uh, wind that hit the windmill and just creaked it, you know, just moved it a little bit. But it's pretty funny because uh, definitely got my attention. I kind of jumped up and uh, I was like, what the hell is that? Well, here's camp for the night. I got about 20 miles in or so today. It's gonna push a little bit further, but uh, there's private land coming up. So it was either stop here or push on another five miles or so. And man, what a rough start to this hike. You know, the human body's capable of amazing things, really being able to adapt to all sorts of extreme levels of activity. It's just that transition period, you know, getting from where you are to where you wanna be where you need to be. It's been hot, it's in the upper 80s. I've got a sunburn on my legs, blisters forming on both my feet, and I still have no appetite. I've eaten maybe a thousand calories today, and I'm not even hungry. I physically gag on almost every everything I try and eat, and then that has a trickle-down effect on everything you do. Obviously, you're tired if you can't replenish the calories that you're expending every day, uh, but it also 
messes with your mind. I just feel really slow and just not with it. I'll get an appetite back. It's just, it's just getting through these first couple of days. As soon as I got in my tent last night, I fell flat on my air mattress, face down, didn't wake up for five hours. It, it just hurt to move. I, I tried to move and just let out a p pathetic whimpering sound. Better luck tomorrow, huh? No, I didn't sleep that great last night. And it was a full moon, basically just right in my face all night, really bright. And it's a herd of cattle or something nearby. Man, they make some bizarre sounds. Never heard cattle make these sounds before. Just in the middle of the night, these cows just started freaking out. Maybe it's the coyotes that were surrounding them. <laughs> you hear them too. Welcome to Valley, Cave Valley. This sign was no match for the local shotgun. These tracks. What you looking at, T-Bone? That's what I thought. And be gone with ye. Gonna love these lone juniper trees out in the desert and the shade that it provides. Absolutely wonderful. It's 9 a.m. and it's already blazing hot. Oh wow, there's actually a bit of a creek here. I was not expecting this. And you can just see all the footprints in it from the cows. And all this water is probably gonna be pretty nasty. There's the first uh, ranch I've seen. So right now the road I'm on is, uh, you know, it's a public road, but it goes through this uh, private ranch. And the owner of the ranch just drove by in his ranch truck. And uh, he says, hey, you all right? Uh, have you, you broke down or something? I said, uh, no, I'm just hiking. And uh, he says, oh, well, we don't, we don't see a lot of hikers around here. Some of the worst kind of dirt to walk through. This stuff is just like soft and your feet sink into it like, an inch or two and just kicks up all this dust. <sighs> Beautiful spot in the shade too, just wonderful. Our, our lives are just so easy now. We don't need to do anything to survive. You just wake up and you turn on your faucet for water. You go to the store for food. You don't have to do anything to, to exist and survive. You know, you just, you're just there. Anybody can do it but you come out here and walk all day in the desert, you come across a flowing creek and shade like this. You really appreciate just the little things in life that I think we take for granted otherwise. Anytime you see like a bank, like a steep cut bank or hillside along a road or just in general, maybe a wash along a river bank or something, it exposes all these different layers. You can see from like my foot up to my head is just all these different layers of rocks. So instead of having to dig for them, you know, they're all just accessible here. You can look at every layer and kind of pick through it. So one of the, one of the best places really to look for rocks. And if you find something that looks interesting, you can take a rock, place it on another rock, crack it open and see if there's anything inside. Unfortunately, they all aren't winners. Just had a chance to uh, take off my shoes and have a look at my feet. And unfortunately, I got a pretty good blister going on here. This whole area right here. Well, I taped her up with some uh, Luco tape. And uh, let's see how this holds up. I put some tape on this morning, but it was just a strip on the bottom. And anytime I've ever done that, it just comes right off. So I tried wrapping it all the way around a couple of times. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Well, this one's about the nastiest I think I've seen. Well, no thanks. 
so many bugs by it, I don't think you could stand to even collect from it. Let's shingle peak up there. True Summit may be hidden from view, maybe just a little beyond that. Uh, but that's the far south Egan Wilderness. And I'm not going that far south. I'm going uh, west. So on a long distance hike, you have so much time to just let your mind wander. Think about anything, you know, anything you want, whatever uh, pops into your head. And one thing I've been thinking about today is why is it that when you go to the airport or a border patrol crossing, a border station, international crossing, they have duty-free stations, duty-free stores, okay? In what other context is sales tax referred to as duty? Let that sink in for a minute. You don't go to buy a new car and they add on 6% duty. You don't go buy a bag of potato chips and pay, you know, whatever your state's uh, duty rate is. But if you go to a duty-free store, you won't have to pay any duty. No duty, no duty. So I just came down Shingle Pass and uh, worked my way around the far south Egan Wilderness. And the original plan was to go over that little saddle there, that little hump, contour around the side of the mountain a little bit, um, and then meet up with Whipple Cave. But with my uh, blisters on the bottom of my feet being the way they are, um, I'm not gonna do anything additional to aggravate them. Man, what a cool view though, coming down here, you know? Like the desert really opens up and just uh, awe-inspiring, really. It's just a bit humbling when you come out to a place like this and see it firsthand. And it's been a really tough section, both physically and mentally. Really kind of feel defeated, you know, having to bail out of the mountains and just kind of skip a lot of the stuff I had originally planned. But sometimes uh, you gotta take a step back and do what's best for the, the greater good of the whole trip. So, Great Basin one, Eric zero. All right, we'll call it a tie. So in the next segment, I cross this valley and uh, hike up to the Grant Range and then the Quinn Canyon Range. The basins honestly are just as impressive as the mountains. You know, you get like a 360 view and just being at the foot of these mountains that just rise up three, four, five, six thousand feet straight out of nothing. So another uh, two miles or so to the highway and I'm tired, I'm sore, my feet hurt, I'm hungry. But you know what? I feel truly alive for the first time since I walked the Continental Divide Trail in 2018. You know, a full range of really intense emotions. So I think the best way you can sum up uh, a through hike, you know, extreme highs, extreme lows, so challenging mentally, physically. Uh, but you know, you feel truly alive and the uh, highway is about a mile off now. Seen a lot of truck traffic go by and not a whole lot of cars. It's not a good sign for me because truckers don't ever stop for hikers. All right, Highway 318, Lund, 30 miles that way. Just gotta see if we can get a hitch here. We just made it to uh, Lane's Ranch Motel in Preston, which is just north of Lund. And look at that beautiful Nevada sunset. Well, time to have a look at the old feet. Let's see what kind of damage has been done. Oh, that's not looking good. That's not looking good.
Thanks for watching. I hope I've earned your subscription and a thumbs up. Visit basinandrangetrail.com for official maps and guidebook, follow Seeking Lost on social media, and consider lending your support on Patreon if you would like to see more quality outdoor content.